Hi. It's my pleasure to be here. So uh, just one second, because there is a window on my screen telling that everything is going to be recorded, but One second, because now okay, so now everything is in order. I had a, a screen on my window telling me that uh, everything is going to be recorded and I could not uh, delete it. So uh, thank you for attending this uh, lecture. My name is uh, Javier Junquera. I am a professor at the University of uh, Cantabria in Spain. And today I will give you a brief overview about uh, localized uh, basis sets. So what is um, a localized basis set? What are they useful for? And the most important uh, features that define the um, uh, this kind of uh, basis sets. Uh, the talk is intended to be quite general. However, since tomorrow we will have another session regarding the introduction of the Siesta code, I would like to point here from the very beginning, the most important references that I will follow in this lecture that made me a little bit biased towards the Siesta method that we will um, uh, explain uh, tomorrow in more detail. Nevertheless, in uh, all these three papers that are uh, highlighted here, you can find uh, all our reference to the most important works in the literature regarding the uh, localized uh, basis sets. So let's uh, start with this slide here that may be, uh, right now it may be rather familiar uh, for some of you. So after a couple of weeks here in this assessment school, I am sure that you have learned how the many body problem can be reduced to a problem of independent particles. And uh, just to summarize this problem of independent particles, you can write one particle like uh, Schrodinger equations or the constant equations that have the same uh, here. So you have the Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian is the sum of the kinetic energy plus the effective potential energy times the eigenfunction, and this is equal to the eigenvalue times the eigenfunction here. And this potential, or this effective potential here is the sum of the external potential, so the pseudo potentials due to the uh, atomic cores, plus the Hartree interaction between the electrons, plus the exchange correlation interaction between the electrons. So now the point is that our goal now is to solve uh, these equations. So solve this equation means that we need to know the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. And this is a very tough problem because in principle for every band or for every state here in our system, we have to know the value of a given function at every single point in space. And this is extremely costly. Okay, so to know the value of this uh, function at every point in space is, uh, is really, really costly. So the solution for this is to expand the eigenvectors in terms of functions that have known properties. And those functions are known as the basis sets. So here, as you see, we can expand my eigenfunction here as a linear combination of my basis functions. And then, I know the how the or I know the shape of the basis function at every point in the space, and then in this way, what we have done is to transform the problem or translate the problem of knowing a function at every point in the space to a problem of finding just a few coefficient complex coefficients here. That is much much simpler. Okay, so that's why we are introducing here the concept of basis functions. Okay, so there are different methods proposed in the literature to, uh, for these uh, basis functions. 
So it is important to know from the very beginning that each method has its own advantages. That means that its, its method is most appropriate for a range of problems and they provide an insightful information in its realm of application. So every method has its pros, but also each method has also its drawbacks, its pitfalls. So it is important also to understand the method and what are the pros and the cons of the different methodologies regarding the uh, basis sets. So in the, in the condensed matter uh, theory in, in solid state physics, typically there are three main families of methods depending on the basis sets. So the first one is the uh, atomic sphere methods. The second one is, uh, is related with plane waves and grids. And the third one is uh, localized basis sets. So though, although despite of the fact that here I will focus on localized basis sets, I would like to take the liberty of uh, expanding just a couple of minutes with the two other methods. It's very likely that you have seen the methods also in the, uh, during the lectures and uh, in the last, uh, couple of days you have played with uh, quantum espresso that is a method that is using plane waves but this uh, can help me just to contextualize the, uh, the realm where these localized basis sets um, are defined and uh, the advantages and the disadvantages of, uh, of them so let's start with the first family of methods that is this atomic sphere method so this is the most the most general method for a precise and accurate solution of the con sum equations. Okay, so this is the most precise method, essentially because here we are getting rid of the pseudo potentials. And that means that the only approach is that remains is the approach of the density functional theory. So the approach, the approach of the functional. But we are we are going to deal with the all electron problem, so no pseudo potentials, and this basis set is um, is asymptotically. Um, complete so the approach of the basis is also totally under control so the general idea behind this method is that we can divide the problem into different regions so imagine that we have a unit cell like this one here in this pink box and we have within this um, unit cell we have some atoms that are represented here by the circles okay so we can split the space in different regions some regions around the atoms where the potential of that particular atom is much stronger than the rest of the potential in the, in the lattice. And therefore, this region is really, really dominated by the uh, atomic like features near its nucleus here. Okay, so here within this, uh, the spheres so or within the, the, the circles here, essentially my problem is an atomic like problem. Okay, with the wave functions here oscillating very much as it happens in the um, atomic orbitals. And then we have here an interstitial region between the atoms where everything is much smoother. Okay, the potential here in the pink region is not so strong as uh, the potential within the spheres. And in this pink region uh, that is much smoother, we can use a representation in terms of plane waves. Okay, so this is the basic idea behind this atomic sphere method. So it just combined the best of the two worlds. Okay, and this has been proposed in a number of uh, uh, different approximations, such as the APW, the augmented plane wave method, or the KKR, the covering up on and Rostocker method, or the Muffin King orbitals. Typically, an L, a capital L is added um, before this, and this uh, capital L stands for linearized uh, methods. So these methods, the solution can be linearized. And sometimes you will hear about uh, linearized augmented plane waves or linearized moving thing orbitals. So the basis set in this case is just a combination of uh, atomic-like um, uh, orbitals within the spheres plus or combined with plane waves uh, in the interstitial region. And then every atomic orbital here in my basis is uh, chosen in such a way that this combination is made very, very smooth at the surface of the sphere. 
Okay, so the combination or the matching of this plane wave with this atomic light um, function within the sphere is done in a very uh, smooth uh, uh, way. So the advantages. So as I have told you, this is the most accurate method within DFT because uh, using this method, we can get rid of the pseudo potentials and the basis set is asymptotically complete. So we can uh, enlarge the basis set in a very well-defined way, in a systematic way to, uh, to achieve a um, full con um, convergence. Okay. The disadvantages. It's uh, very expensive. Also, if we consider the core electrons uh, explicitly in the calculation, then the absolute values of the total energies are really, really high. And that means that if in our problem we are looking for very subtle differences in energies, then the calculations must be very well converged, not to miss this uh, the subtle difference in energy in a huge um, value for the absolute energy. And also they are somehow, they are difficult to implement. So this uh, method is not so straightforward as a plane wave uh, method that we will see in the following slide. So that's regarding the atomic sphere methods. Then what about the second family, the plane wave uh, method? So in the plane wave, as uh, from the very uh, name we can ascertain, we are going to use plane waves as our basis functions, okay? So here I have my eigen function of the Hamiltonian, and then I'm going to expand this eigen function as a linear combination of plane waves. So advantages. So this is by far the most extended methods uh, between the solid state physics community. Conceptually, it's very simple because at the end of the day, this operation here means nothing else than taking a Fourier transform back and forth between real and reciprocal space. So this is computationally very simple. This basis set is asymptotically complete. That means that uh, I know how to improve my calculation and also the, uh, the, the convergence is systematic. There is only one way to improve the uh, quality of the basis set. That means increase here the uh, cutoff energy for the uh, corresponding plane wave here. So the another advantage is that they are especially spatially unbiased. So, so that means that the basis does not depend on the atomic positions and they are also easy, quotes, it's easy to implement um, in the sense that uh, the basic operation here is a Fourier transform between real and reciprocal uh, space. So the not so good things about this uh, basis set is that, okay, they are not, um, they are not um, dependent on the atomic position. So every point in a space will be um, described in, with the same accuracy, but also they are not suited to represent any function in particular. I mean, if you want to represent a function that is somehow localized with um, a cusp, like in the case of uh, 3D or 2P orbitals, then you will need many, many, many plane waves to represent or to reproduce such a, a shape. Okay, that means or that translates into the fact that we require hundreds of plane waves per atom to achieve good accuracy. So that means that the size of the basis set will be uh, really large. Also, if you have vacuum in your system, then the uh, computational cost to describe this vacuum is the same as the computational cost to describe a region in a space where you have some atoms. Okay, so, so somehow we are wasting uh, computational um, resources because the description of vacuum will take also some uh, effort. And as I, as I told you before, they may be quite um, uh, difficult to convert uh, in the case where you are dealing with tight binding, uh, sorry, with tight uh, orbitals, with uh, 3D or 2P uh, orbitals. Then another important point thing, uh, another important thing uh, here is that um, the uh, scaling regarding the uh, computational cost, both in time and memory with the system size. 
So in the standard DFT methods that require the diagonalization or the minimization of the, um, uh, of the energy by uh, diagonalizing the Hamiltonian matrix element, the computational cost scales as the cube of the number of atoms in your system. So if you increase the number of atoms in your simulation box, the computational cost increases uh, as the cube of the number of atoms, and there will be a threshold beyond which the calculation will be very, uh, very, very costly, and therefore it cannot be uh, done in, in, in a regular, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the usual platforms that we are uh, using. So in order to make an uh, intelligent use of the increasing power of computers, for first principle simulations, it is important to develop and, and tune linear scaling methods or order and methods where the computational load, both in time and in memory, scales linearly with the number of atoms in the simulation box. So if we work along this line here, within this order and methods, uh, then we can afford larger, uh, larger systems in modest uh, computational uh, platforms. So in order to get this uh, linear scaling, the locality is a very, very important point. So imagine that we want to describe a very large system. And imagine that we can split this large system in uh, smaller uh, pieces like this. So I have my green box here, my unit cell here in, in, in green. And then I can split, I can um, divide it in a smaller regions and mark it here with the squares. And imagine that in order to describe the electronic properties within one of these squares, then I can attend only or I can be uh, taking care only of the properties of the square itself. And maybe a neighbor, some neighbors saw cells here around the uh, square of interest. That means that imagine that the properties uh, of the system can be described in a local way. Then, if this is true, if we can achieve this uh, way of describing things, if we double the size of the system, no uh, new calculations will be required to describe the properties of this blue square here. Of course, we will need to perform more calculations because there are more squares, but the computational cost per square would be exactly the same. Okay, so that's the meaning behind this, or that's the most important thing behind these um, linear scaling uh, methods. So as you see, locality is uh, one of the key ingredients in order to achieve this uh, linear scaling. So if locality is a very important ingredient, then a sensible choice would be to use a basic set of localized functions. Okay, so that's the topic of this of these lectures. But not only the scaling is important, the scaling is not the only thing that matters. So the prefactor is also important for efficiency. Okay, so it's not the same to have a linear dependency as the as the red line here or as the blue line here. So no, we are interested not only in the scaling, but also in the prefactor. And regarding the prefactor, there are two um, um, features that are very, very important. Okay, So the feature regarding the, the basis set is the number of basis functions per atom and the range of localization of this function. So I will describe in the following slides what I mean by number of um, or the size of the basis set or the range of localization of the basis sets. So now I think I have um, underlined the importance for implementing these localized basis sets in order of um, just uh, thinking to account the efficiency of the calculation. And here again, uh, there are different proposals in the literature for the uh, for the uh, implementation of this localized uh, basis set. For instance, it can be made of uh, Bessel functions in overlapping spheres, as uh, Peter Haynes proposed uh, some years ago. They may be also non-orthogonal 
generalized barrier functions as proposed in uh, one tip. Another code implementing this order and uh, technologies. They may be localized functions around a given point in a space that uh, you can call them the uh, blips. Okay, so a blip is one of these 3D uh, spatially localized uh, functions as uh, implemented in the conquest uh, code. They may be also real space grids. So a real space, uh, space grid is nothing else than a delta function. So it's uh, taking the limit of this blip here and define a delta function instead of a, a function with uh, the radial extension as shown here. And then we can combine these real space grids with finite different methods as done by uh, Jerry Fernholk and, and co-workers. They can be uh, wavelets as proposed by uh, Stefan, Stefan Godecker and co-workers in this reference here, or maybe atomic orbitals. That, uh, uh, those are also a very extended um, family of localized basis sets. And from the rest of the talk, I, I will localize on, on them, on the uh, atomic orbitals. So, Using atomic orbitals, uh, by using uh, atomic orbitals as basis set, I mean to use a function like this. So for the rest of the talk, uh, atomic orbital will be the product of a radial part times a spherical harmonic. Okay, so it's the product of these two uh, functions here. In this function, we uh, merge all the radial dependency of the basis and here the angular uh, dependency. So what are the advantages or and the disadvantages of the uh, of a basis set of atomic orbitals? The advantages, they are very, very efficient. I mean uh, by efficiency, I mean here the, that the number of basis functions needed is usually very, very small. The rule of thumb is that uh, we require of the order of three to five basis functions per electron in our calculation, while typically in a plane wave code, the, it's of the order of uh, 100. Okay, so there is a large reduction in the number of basis sets in my in, in the description of the system, and that immediately translates into the fact that the Hamiltonian and the overlap matrices will be much smaller. And that means a large reduction of CPU time and memory. So that means that we can afford larger, we can deal with larger system in modest computational platforms. Another advantage is that uh, they allow the straightforward physical interpretation of some um, of the results. For instance, the population analysis in terms of uh, how much uh, charge do I, do I have in a SP or D cell. I can immediately perform the projected density of states. Okay? So many of the, most of the chemical uh, um, language in terms of atomic orbitals can be easily incorporated in the analysis of my results. The vacuum is almost for free. Okay, so um, uh, the vacuum you can, it's not the same as in plain wave codes. The vacuum, you can include as much uh, a vacuum as you want, and it is essentially uh, for free. And we can achieve very high accuracies, but as you see here, I'm writing some um, dots because this is also one of the disadvantages of these uh, atomic orbitals. So we can achieve very high accuracies, but there is a lack of systematic for convergence. I mean, you can increase the quality of the basis sets. It's clear, but there is, there is not a unique way to increase the quality of the basis set. There is not a unique way of enlarge, of enlarge the basis set. So that means that some human and computational effort in order to search for a good basis set must be done before starting a project. Okay. And it is the responsibility of the user. It is a problem that is similar to the problem of the pseudo potentials. So before starting a calculation with a plane wave code, you need to uh, spend a few, uh, uh, some time 
to explore the uh, transferability and the softness of your pseudo potential. Okay, so here is the same, but on top of the pseudo potential, we have also to take care of the uh, of the basis set. And also another uh, disadvantage is that uh, these uh, uh, basis functions depend also on the atomic position. So at the time of uh, at the time of implementing uh, some features, uh, we may uh, take into we may uh, take into account also some uh, pool corrections that sometimes are not easy to to, to implement. Uh, Javier, just yeah. a second. Do you prefer questions in between or at the end? I prefer questions on the fly. Okay, so I wanted to ask about Gaussians because you didn't say anything about Gaussians as Not yet. Set. No, not yet. You will, you, you will, it will come? Absolutely. Okay. In, in one slide from now. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Again, regarding the atomic orbitals, as I was uh, telling you um, before, we are uh, considering that my basis function is the product, the product of a radial part times a spherical harmonics. And here, uh, for in order to uh, describe the, the basis, I should um, include here the index of the atom where the uh, atomic orbital is centered, and maybe some um, quantum numbers, for instance, the uh, angular quantum number and the magnetic quantum number. And then maybe that for a given quantum number, I can include more than one uh, basis function, okay? So I have for every atom and for the different shells in this atom, then I have different basis sets here, okay? So, here you are, this, um, the discussion regarding the Gaussians and the different kinds of um, atomic uh, orbitals as basis set. So as you see here, we have a radial part. And this radial part here, we can describe it in very different ways. So one way of describing this radial part here is using a linear combination of Gaussians. And this is very, very extended in the quantum chemistry uh, community, okay? Uh, the reason behind this is that the product of two Gaussians is another Gaussian. And there are very, very, very efficient libraries that make uh, take profit of this property in order to compute four center integrals. So the calculations required to include the, um, the SAT exchange or the um, Hartree-Fock, uh, uh, the integrals that appear in the Hartree-Fock uh, or the um, uh, configuration interaction um, uh, methodologies can be very, very efficiently computed with Gaussians, okay? Uh, Different codes implementing this, okay, of course, Gaussian or Martin Hert Gordon uh, make use of this in QCAM uh, program, or Orlando Dobesian co workers in Crystal, or George Hooter and co workers in CP2K. So there are many different codes just expanding here the radial part as a linear combination of Gaussians. Other codes uh, decided to just use uh, a slighter, a slighter type orbitals. That's the case of the Amsterdam density functional code that here expand this radial function in terms of uh, slighter type orbitals that are also very efficient and resemble uh, much more uh, the shape of the atomic orbitals in, um, uh, in um, uh, the shape of the atomic orbital in the isolated atoms, but they lack this uh, efficiency of, um, of this uh, theorem that tells you that the product of two Gaussians is another Gaussian, okay? So that's why people move from slighter type orbitals to, gas to Gaussian type orbitals. And then there is a third family that um, uh, make uh, use of numerical atomic orbitals. So that means that we are going to solve the Schrodinger equation for the isolated atom and then tabulate this radial function in a grid. And then we are going to perform just some, um, some um, interpolation uh, of these uh, tables at runtime. So does it answer the question? 
Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. So uh, please, if you have uh, more questions, uh, do not hesitate to ask them on the fly. Okay. So, okay, so regarding this uh, numerical atomic orbitals, as I was telling you, what we are going to do is to solve the um, consum Hamiltonian for the isolated atom within the same approximation, I mean the same exchange correlation or the same pseudo potentials as for the condensed system. So the thing is that we are going to solve an equation like this in a linear grid. And typically this grid, or sorry, a linear grid, not in a radial grid. And typically this radial grid is logarithmic. And by logarithmic- uh, Okay, I have a question. Since you yeah. say pseudo atom, that means you do only the valence electrons still? Only, only the valence electrons. Okay. Right. So the core electrons are, or the interaction between the core electrons and the valence electrons are, um, um, are taking into account in the pseudo potential. Okay. So this logarithmic grid means that you, we have plenty of points, a very dense uh, a grid here close to the nuclei where the radial functions are expected to change uh, very abruptly. And then when we move towards larger uh, distances, then the grid is more and more um, uh, relaxed. So the distance between consecutive points in the grid is, is enlarged. Okay. So we solve numerically this equation. It's, uh, there are methods like, for instance, the number of methods that allow to do this in a very uh, uh, efficient uh, uh, way, and this is the first time, the first thing that is done in uh, Siesta or in uh, OpenMX or in any other code using these numerical atomic orbitals. Okay, and then we okay, I have a question again. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt so many times. Don't worry, don't worry. I was wondering why you take the pseudo potential and only the valence electrons because I thought the one of the advantages of an atomic orbital basis is that you don't have to use a pseudo potential. That's uh, true, but on the other hand, in many uh, problems, I mean, there, there is not uh, there, there is not a restriction like in the case of plane waves. So if you are, if you want to deal with a core electron, then the core the core electrons do have a lot of wiggles and a lot of oscillations close to the nuclei here mostly due to the orthogonality conditions with the balance electrons. And if you are using radial um, or atomic uh, orbitals like this, there is, there is not a, a restriction in order to deal with these um, core electrons explicitly in your, in your calculation. But on the other hand, typically these core electrons are blind to the chemical environment in the sense that they are very, very localized, in energy, very localized in space and very deep in energy. So in many cases, uh, the only thing that they are doing or the only physical effect is just the screening of the nuclear potential, okay? So therefore, uh, it's uh, very, very usual that we combine this, the advantage of the pseudo potential approach to get rid of the core electrons especially in those cases where the most important uh, or the most important effect is just the screening of the nuclear uh, potential and then combine the pseudo potential approach with the basis set approach okay so answering your question you are totally right in the sense that we don't have this the restrictions uh, imposed by plane waves for instance but in many cases we are using pseudo potentials besides the approximation of the basis Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so here again, we have this uh, general uh, expression for the, or for my basis set of uh, atomic orbitals, of localized atomic orbitals. And if we take a look to the um, angular dependency here that is uh, recovered in this, in this spherical harmonics, then we can see how the spherical harmonics uh, that are typically used are uh, real spherical harmonics. And that means that the shape is well-defined. So we have the S uh, spherical harmonic that is uh, just a sphere 
the P that is just two lobules uh, separated by a, um, a planar node, the D orbitals, the F orbitals, and so on and so forth. But the shape is is uh, is fixed. Okay, so the degree of freedom is uh, within the radial part. Okay, and within this degree, this radial part, that is the, the, the degree of freedom we can play with. We have to deal with the size. I mean the number of atomic orbitals per atom, and with the range. I mean the extension of the uh, radial uh, orbitals, and also with the shape. So those are the three uh, signatures, the three uh, features that uh, uh, enter into play when we define the radial part and that uh, allow me to perform more or less uh, efficient uh, calculations. So regarding the size, regarding the number of bases set per atom. So depending on the accuracy uh, required in my problem and the computational uh, power accessible, then I can perform from quick exploratory calculations using a minimal basis set. I will define in a minute what is a minimal basis set to highly converge calculations. So we can walk from very, very cheap calculations to uh, very uh, converge and then um, uh, calculations regarding the basis. Okay. The point is that the way from here, from the left, uh, from the left side of the arrow to the right side of the arrow is not unique. So there are many ways of uh, walking along this line here. Okay, it's not the same as in plane waves or in um, uh, augmented plane waves where the uh, convergence is uh, well defined and uh, is uh, asymptotically or is uh, well defined and asymptotic. Okay. So what is uh, what I was calling here the uh, minimal basis set or the single theta basis set? So we consider a single theta basis set that is also called minimal as a basis set that has only one single radial function per angular momentum channel and only for those angular momenta with substantial electronic populations in the balance of the free electron. Let me put here an example. Imagine that we want to simulate um, a silicon atom, okay? And we are considered the pseudo potential approach. So this is the uh, atomic configuration for the silicon atom. It's one S2, two S2, two P6, three S2, three P2. And then we consider that the three, the, the, the first three shells belong to the core. So they are essentially chemically inert. And then the last two ones, the three S2 and the three P2 belongs to the balance. And I am interested in describing here the balance state for the silicon atom. That means that I would require per silicon atom just one radial function for the S channel and one radial function for the P channel. Okay, for the P channel, I have the um, Px, Py, and P theta orbitals. So that means that with only four atomic orbitals per silicon atom. I can perform uh, uh, calculations for bulk silicon, for instance. Okay, and that means only four atomic orbitals per atom. So really, really efficient. For iron, for instance. So for iron, I have this is my uh, the, the electronic configuration for the, my iron atom, and I am considering those shells here in the core and those shells here in the balance. So I can perform a calculation for the iron atom, just considering only one radial function for the S. And since I have only one spherical harmonic, that means only one basis functions for the S channel, and then one radial function for the D. But for the D, I have five spherical harmonics, okay? So therefore, to perform a calculation for bulk iron, for instance, I need only six atomic orbitals per iron atom. Okay, so here you can see how uh, efficient these uh, atomic orbitals uh, are. There is an important point here. So regarding, for instance, okay, the the, the, the optical or the the optimal atomic 
orbitals are environmental dependent. So that means, imagine that we have here this uh, example with the H2 molecule. So what would be the optimal shape of the atomic orbitals if the two hydrogen atoms are very, very far away one from the other? So if the two atoms are very far away one from the other, that means that the distance between them tends to infinite. And then the optimal shape will be this um, exponentially decay function. Okay, so this is the wave function for the isolated uh, um, hydrogen atom. And that would be the perfect shape of the atomic orbitals if they are very far away, if the two hydrogen atoms are very far away one from the other. Imagine that we are in the opposite side. Imagine that R, sorry, imagine that R tends to zero. Okay, that means that at the limit, we are going to deal with the helium atom. And the optimal shape for the helium uh, radial function is an exponential like this. It's the exponential, but instead of minus r here, is the exponential to minus 2r. And in between, so for um, defined values of this uh, r between the distance between the two hydrogen atoms, I may have something that will be between this case and that case here. So it would be very, very important that in my basis set, that the basis set are generated for isolated atoms, but at the end, they will be used in molecules or condensed systems where the distance between different atoms can change. And it would be nice that my basis function should be flexible enough to reproduce limit case like this one here or that one here, okay? And that this can be done using or just adding flexibility to the basis to adjust to different configurations, okay? So how can we enlarge the quality of my basis uh, set? So to improve the quality, as uh, defined in the previous example for the, ileo, for the H2 molecule, we may add some radial flexibilization. So my basis function should be good enough to deal with systems where the charge density would want to be more compressed or more expanded depending on the position of the atoms. And this can be done adding more than one radial function with the same angular momentum than the single seat. This is called a multiple seat basis set. So instead of considering just one radial function for the S, consider two radial functions for the S. And we can use one of them to describe situations where the charge density is more extended and the other to describe uh, situations where the charge density is more compressed. And then the basis set with where the basis set will adapt immediately to uh, possible changes uh, in the description of, of the um, of the system. So there are different ways also to generate this multiple system. So one of them is uh, okay. You solve the Schrodinger equation for the pseudo atom, for instance. But instead of keeping only just the ground state you can keep also excited states, okay? So this is the approach taken by uh, Osaki and co-workers in the OpenMX code. So the advantages of this method is that all these uh, functions will be orthogonal and uh, this method is asymptotically complete. So you include more and more nodes in your system and then in your basis set and then the calculation improves asymptotically to, uh, to the converged uh, solution. The disadvantage is that uh, typically the excited states are um, unbound in the atom. And sometimes it's difficult to get confined states, confined states for the excited um, uh, levels. And also the efficiency depends on the localization uh, value. So another uh, way of uh, using the sequence theta is just uh, what, to use what uh, some people call the chemical hardness. So use the derivatives of the first theta with respect to the charge of the atoms. Okay, so you have a first theta atomic orbital and then you charge a little bit your atom and then you compute the derivative of the radial shape with respect to the charge of the atom. Okay, so this is done for instance in the CP2K uh, uh, code. 
The advantages again, so the different uh, functions will be orthogonal and uh, this method does not depend on any variational uh, parameter. Okay, so it's also uh, uh, well defined in the sense that no, no extra parameters are required. And the disadvantages is that the range of the second uh, zeta, so the range of localization of the second zeta, the extension of the second function equals the extension of the first one. Another uh, way of uh, splitting your, your basis or adding uh, a second zeta basis function is follow the uh, recipe given by the quantum chemistry community. So in the quantum chemistry community, uh, when they are using this expansion of, uh, uh, they are considering the radial part of the atomic orbital as a, a linear combination of Gaussians, in some cases, they are taking the most extended Gaussians and they separate that Gaussian from the rest. Okay, so we can do essentially the same thing here. Imagine that uh, we have an atomic orbital whose shape is this one here that came from the solution of the Schrodinger equation in the, in the isolated atom. And then we start from this first zeta function and then we are going to define a second zeta that will reproduce the tail of the first zeta beyond a given radius that I'm calling here Rn. And then I am going to define here a function that goes smoothly to zero, for instance, using this parabolic uh, shape here, and that joins the tail of the first uh, function in a, a smooth way here, okay? I mean, by smooth, I mean that the uh, function and the first derivative, for instance, are continuous. So you take this as your first zeta and this as your second zeta. Okay, so this is essentially the same schema proposed in the quantum chemistry community for the uh, split balance. Now we know that how we can expand exactly the same Hilbert space, but instead of taking the first zeta and the second zeta, we can take the first zeta and the difference between the two. And that's what we are doing here. And this has the advantage that the second zeta is more localized. And therefore, the computational cost is as much as more. Okay. So this is uh, what we call the uh, split balance method. That is, for instance, the default used in, in, in Siesta. Okay, so that's regarding the um, radial flexibilization. So what we are doing is to allow my basis set to um, describe uh, um, with high accuracy situations where the charge density wants to be more enlarged or compressed. But what about the angular flexibilization? For, so for the angular flexibilization, we can add what we are calling the polarization orbitals. And a polarization orbital means that we are going to add cells of different atomic symmetry from those included in the multiple in the, in the minimal basis sets. Okay, so let me put an example here. So again, we are dealing with this uh, silicon uh, atom here. So in the minimum in the minimal basis set, we have the s uh, orbital that is a sphere, and the p orbitals that are this uh, p x, p y, and p zeta that are represented by these two uh, lobules here, separated by the planar node. If we want to, to increase the angular flexibilization, we may include a shell of L equal to orbitals. That means that the new orbitals will be directed in different directions in a space with respect to the original basis. And therefore, we can describe more accurately uh, different orientations of a space. In other words, we are adding angular flexibility to my basis. Okay, so that's the meaning of our polarization uh, orbit. Okay, I think uh, we have started a little bit uh, uh, later, but in just to speed up, uh, speed up a little bit, there are different ways of producing polarization orbitals. One way, for instance, is to uh, apply a, a small electric field to the orbital we want to polarize. So you want to polarize 
an S orbital, you can apply an electric field to the S orbital. As a consequence of the application of the field, the shape of the atomic orbital will change. And then we can extract, you can define the shape of the new atomic orbital as a linear combination of the S and the P shells. So from the solution of this and the solution of this, you can um, extract um, the, the functions for the, uh, or the radial shape for the P orbitals here. And another way of doing or, or, or getting the polarization orbitals is to solve the Schrodinger equation, but for higher angular momentum than those uh, presented in the minimal basis set. Okay, so here, for instance, you have some results produced with Siesta that allow us to check the convergence of the basis set as a function of their size. Okay, so here at the left panel, we are representing the energy versus uh, volume or versus the lattice constant in this case for bulk silicon as a function of the quality of the basis for single zeta, double zeta, double, triple zeta here, single zeta polarized, double zeta polarized, and so on and so forth. So we can add triple zeta, triple zeta, double polarized, triple zeta, triple polarized, or triple zeta, triple polarized, and F uh, orbitals. And then we are com uh, comparing the results with plane converged plane wave results using the same pseudo potential that is here. Okay, so we can see how okay the convergence is uh, uh, not systematic in the sense that, as, as you have seen, there are many ways of defining the second zeta or the triple zeta, or many ways of uh, including the polarization orbitals. So there is not a unique way of getting a converged basis set. However, in terms of the number of atomic orbitals in the basis, in the basis set, uh, uh, quite good converged calculations can be uh, obtained in the sense that with a uh, relatively uh, large basis set, we can get the same results as converged plane waves here. So this can be seen more uh, easily here in the, in the right panel where, where we are comparing the total energy for a given uh, a structure as a function of the quality of the basis set, as a function of the size of the basis set. Okay, and here the zero is, uh, is set up to the converged plane wave uh, limit, a converged plane wave calculation. So here we can see how as uh, we uh, since uh, when we increase the size of the basis set, the energy is lower and asymptotically we can achieve also uh, the same results as a converged plane wave. It is very important here to note how for a relatively uh, modest basis size, for instance, double zeta polarized basis set, we achieve quite good converged uh, results of the same quality, for instance, as uh, here, maybe of the order of 25 Rydbergs for uh, silicon. That is, uh, okay, this is one reasonable value you are in calculating silicon with plane waves. Okay, I think I will skip this for uh, timing. So up to now we have discussed um, we have discussed the size of the basis uh, set. So what about the range? By range, I mean the uh, localization of the of, of the basis set. So how far the, the 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 atomic orbitals will be extended in space? So the implementation of these linear scaling methods rely heavily on locality. And that means that they rely heavily also on the uh, range of the uh, atomic orbitals. Imagine that we impose that our atomic orbitals are strictly confined, okay? And by strictly confined, we mean that they are zero beyond a given cut of radius. Then, if two atomic orbitals are very far away one from the other, the overlap and the Hamiltonian matrix elements will be zero, okay? Because they don't overlap each other. So this integral here will be immediately zero and the corresponding uh, matrix elements for the Hamiltonian here will be zero. That means that there will be a lot of uh, Hamiltonian and overlap matrix elements that will be zero due to this uh, range of localization. 
And that opens the door for the implementation of sparse matrices. Matrices where most of the elements are zero. And there are very, very efficient libraries to deal with uh, sparse matrix multiplications or um, handling the linear algebra of sparse matrices. So how, how can we um, define this sparsity? So we can neglect interactions, for instance, below a tolerance. So we can say, okay, below a given value of the overlap or below a given value for the Hamiltonian, and we consider that this matrix element is zero. Okay, or we can um, neglect interactions beyond a given scope of neighbors, for instance. So beyond the third cell of neighbors, I will the five, uh, the fifth cell of neighbors, I will consider that my interactions are zero. So this can be done, and this is uh, done, for instance, in the case, in, in some cases where you have extended or functions that never goes to zero, like uh, the case never go exactly to zero. That the case is the case of precautions, but uh, it may have the difficulty that uh, they may introduce numerical instabilities for very high uh, tolerances. And another way of imposing this sparsity is the use of strictly localized atomic orbitals. And by strictly localized, uh, we mean that um, they are exactly zero beyond a given cutoff radius. Okay, so they have the advantage that um, uh, okay, then um, they are numerically stable. But then the, the the point is how to define a way to cut the atomic orbitals in an efficient way and in a balanced way. Okay. So uh, a scheme for this has been proposed um, uh, in, in Siesta, for instance, where the radii were defined just by one single parameter. That's what we call the energy shift. That is defined as the uh, rays of energy that a uh, given atomic orbital suffered when it is confined. So when you confine uh, a given function, the energy increases. And therefore, if you increase here or you solve this equation here, but by increasing by hand the energy of a given orbital, then the radial function here, radial part of the wave function will be confined. And using here the same energy shift for all the orbitals in your system and all the atoms in your system, you can cut the basis set in a balanced and a well-defined way. Okay, so this was introduced in this uh, reference here, and it has been shown to be very, very um, a very efficient way of cutting the numerical orbitals in a balanced way and avoiding just uh, uh, disproportionation in the um, in the energy where we are, where we are um, or the range of the orbitals that we are cutting. Okay, so here, for instance, you have the results for bulk silicon, the results for the lattice constant, the bulk module, and the cohesive energy as a function of the range of the atomic orbitals for two different sizes of the bases, for single zeta or double zeta polarized uh, basis sets. And here we are comparing also the results with respect to plane waves, converged plane waves calculations. And you can see how, okay, for the, the larger, the cutoff radii, the uh, more accurate the calculation will be with respect to a converged plane wave calculations. You can see here the results uh, comparing a double zeta polarized species set uh, for the uh, lattice constant, for the uh, bulk module, and for the cohesive energy. So it's pretty converged. But there is always a balance. So the larger the cutoff uh, radii, the more accurate the calculation. But uh, the, the shorter the cutoff uh, radii, the more efficient the calculation will be, because we are going to consider less and less orbit, uh, less and less matrix elements in our Hamiltonian and the overlap matrices. So a final uh, point to play with is the shape of the atomic orbitals. So we have defined the um, size, we have defined the range, and uh, now we may want to um, play also with the shape of the atomic orbitals. So regarding the shape, we can introduce an extra 
uh, uh, variable here, a parameter, to define the basis that is the extra charge. So instead of uh, solving the Schrodinger equation for a neutral atom, we can solve the Schrodinger equation for an anion. And that means that the orbitals will be more delocalized or for a cation. And that means that the orbital would be more localized. Okay, So this may be an extra parameter that also allows me to um, play a little bit with the shape of the atomic orbitals. Or we can solve the Schrodinger equation but within a confinement potential. Okay? And this confinement potential can impose also the strict localization of my basis and to play with the shape of the basis orbitals. So in the original uh, uh, paper, just defining by this, this way of uh, defining the basis set, it was due to Sankey and Nikleski in this paper almost 30 years ago. So they use hard confinement. That means uh, infinite wall here, and the wall was located at the position of the cutoff radius. Okay. So the advantage it produced very uh, uh, confined uh, orbitals, and empirically we know that it works uh, nice. But on the other hand, it, the, the, the the atomic the shape here displays a kink in the first uh, derivative. So the function is a continuous, but the first derivative is discontinuous. And this can introduce some noise at the time of um, computing things in combination with numerical uh, grids. So some efforts have been done by different authors, by Forsyth or Forcefield, just to define or to uh, atomic orbitals that are continuous with all the derivative continuous. So they introduced here a um, confinement potential like this one here that may look like a, a, a parabola, like in the case of Forza and co-workers, or um, uh, this shape here with the dotted uh, line here that is r to the six power. But the point is that using these uh, confinement potentials, then the atomic orbital will never be strictly confined. The atomic orbital will um, uh, will never be exactly uh, zero because the confinement potential never goes to infinite. Other authors uh, propose to play directly with the shape of the atomic orbitals, multiplying it by a cutting function like this. Okay, so this is another way of, in, of playing with the shape of the atomic orbital, just multiplying it by uh, a cutting function, imposing also a strict uh, localization for a given cutoff radius. And also, uh, I proposed some years ago uh, another confinement potential that is uh, continuous with all the derivative continuous and impose a strict localization at a given cutoff radius. So this potential here diverges at a given cutoff radius Rc. But using it, the, uh, the function is strictly confined, but it will be continuous with all the derivative uh, continuous. So finally, as you have seen, there are many parameters. This is the last slide. So there are many parameters that allow us to define the uh, size, the range, the shape, and therefore the quality of a basis set made of numerical atomic orbitals. So one way of choosing, uh, of choosing them is just by a minimization of the energy as a function of all these parameters. So this minimization can be done using the simplex uh, minimization algorithm. And then in, uh, you can get at the end, the, the, the basis set problem is variational. That means that the better your basis set, the lower the energy. So minimizing this total energy as a function of the parameters, you can get in an automatic way, uh, the best uh, parameters for the extra charge or the cutoff radius or the inner, uh, uh, cutoff for the double theta, etc., uh, in uh, in an automatic uh, fashion, and the results are, are really really good. So finally, finally, I'm running out of time, so I would like to give here this uh, recap uh, slide, and uh, okay, I will be happy to take your your questions. <laughs>